today. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about lightning data. I probably have an hour's worth of material here. Uh, I'm gonna stop occasionally. I love to hear questions and have some discussion um, at different points. I'll take you through some 101 because I know a lot of us don't get to talk about uh, lightning much in our meteorology courses. Um, it's left a lot to physics and then the physics is just kind of the ENM bit. So um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of things happening, new instrumentation. I'll cover some stuff about the geostationary lightning mapper and I'll talk a little bit about that probabilistic um, forecast that we're beginning to develop. So um, first and foremost, a good reason to care is just general lightning safety. Um, we do have a number of deaths every year uh, and even more injuries. We just passed our National Lightning Safety Week a couple weeks ago. Um, one thing that surprised me, I'm now on the National Lightning Safety Council and you can see the website there, uh, but until I joined, I actually didn't realize um, how old this When Thunder Roars Go Indoors a statement is. It's actually a lot newer than I expected. It felt like it had been historically in my head for forever. Um, but it's not actually true. It was uh, developed in 2003 and it was uh, coined at a NWA meeting um, around that time. Hold on just a second. I apologize for that, my uh, three-year-old. Um, needed a couple little bit of attention anyway um it was developed in 2003 and before that it was just lightning kills um which was kind of direct and to the point but i, I do think the when thunder roars go indoors now has been well ingrained um recently uh due to a couple of weather service forecasters uh, to help address kind of other needs um address for the heart of uh, hearing uh see a flash dash inside, I think is the new one. And somebody can correct me if I'm misusing that. But with that, um, let me switch to the next slide. Here are the lightning fatalities just in the last nine years, a lot of smattering across the United States. Um, in central region, I believe that takes us out to Colorado and then across the plains and then into the Great Lakes area. Uh, so a number of hotspots, obviously Florida sticks out, but also a few areas in the central plains. So that ties well, pretty well, with our map of cloud to ground lightning frequency. So this is over 20 years um, color coding to give you the emphasis. So obviously Florida, we always talk about Florida and then of course around the Gulf Coast. Um, you also see that kind of peak area going across Oklahoma and into the central plains and then across Kansas and into Missouri and then up towards the Great Lakes and then right around the front range of the Rockies is always uh, additionally a risky place. So what are people doing um, that get them struck by lightning? Number one, grouping is kind of in that leisure activity. So that includes like activities such as fishing, a huge percentage are fishing, um, being on the beach or camping, um, but also people going around their daily routine, whether it's walking to and from home across the parking lot, a lot of more uh, commonly, we're also seeing a lot of roofing and construction type work. I know soccer and golf have been out there um, historically, but I think people are beginning to pay a little bit more attention. So going down, if you go to that lightningsafetycouncil.org, there'll be the actual desk, what happened, what they were doing, um, whether it is in this case, I'm showing a bunch of fishing just from 2014 going back. It's a lot more deaths than what are just shown here. But just to give an idea of the range of ages, um, predominantly male, uh, a lot of these activities are predominantly male, but we do see a variety, especially as you go to activities like hiking. Uh, a lot of people just kind of wrong place, wrong time. I think one thing we can do, especially in areas like Colorado where hiking can become risky in the afternoons, particularly around this time of year, is really emphasize to people they need to get on the trail early in the day and be done um, by that afternoon when pretty much every day has a chance of storms in certain times, in certain seasons, and really emphasize that just shouldn't be out in a later afternoon. For 2020, uh, we're up to, I believe, eight deaths. As I looked at this, I think earlier this week, or maybe the end of last week, 
uh, again, kind of similar varieties of things. Some people were just doing their normal routine, um, some work, lawn care, construction, roofing. I know one thing we're finding now is we're having a lot of problems reaching the Hispanic population um, about the need for lightning safety and a lot of the deaths recently have been, come from that. So I know the Lightning Safety Council is starting to figure out ways to reach out to additional populations that may not be getting the message. So from here, I'm gonna go on to some kind of just storm electrification basics, uh, just because I know a lot of people don't get the chance to review or see as much. And I believe a lot of these things have changed, particularly over the last 10 to 15 years. So before I do that, I'm happy to take any questions about lightning safety or any of the kind of statistics coming across for that. Yes, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand or type it into the question pane at this time. All right, feel free to drop in any um, questions in the chat or in the question pane throughout, and I'll try to kind of keep an eye on that. But um, moving on to kind of storm electrification basics. Um, occasionally, I kind of look what's out online, and some of it's really bad. So um, there's a lot of historical um, fair weather electric field attracts to a cloud as the cloud forms, and that's how storm electrification is done still. There's even some weather service pages that have that. Um, I hope most people have gone beyond that, but I do think a lot of understanding still comes back to a dipole tripole model of charge in a thunderstorm. And I, what I want to get at is that it's really much more complex than that. So this even goes back to 1998. And this, I still think, is kind of simplified to what we um, still see as we've gotten more complex in the modeling. So a little bit about why the tripole structure is there. And in certain cases, it's still appropriate and um, how it forms. So at the very basic sense, uh, storm electrification comes from uh, in an updraft area or uh, where you have ice ice collisions. So I'm talking about like the grapple and uh, kind of pristine ice like your your cloud ice that um, collide in the presence of super cool liquid water. Essentially, and that's non-inductive, and by that, all we mean is it operates independent of a background electric field. And that's what separates it from like, hey, there's a fair, electric, a fair weather field and this forms. No, what happens is um, basically the two ice um, particles collide and there's a re there needs to be a rebounding collision. And so, but when they collide, that liquid water is exchanged. So sometimes this is referred to as the rhyme accretion rate, which one is growing faster, will um, give up more liquid. And with that liquid, the electrons move. And so basically what you end up with is one um, form of ice. And in this case, I have the grapple gains an extra electron or gets an enhanced negative charge and the small ice is positively charged. And depending on the actual rhyme accretion rate of the individual particles depends on which way that sign goes. And so that can be a little bit different. So sometimes we talk about this polarity reversal temperature around minus 15 degrees Celsius where that changes phase on which is growing faster. There's a little bit more complex than that, but for description, I think that's pretty fair. So in this case, what we're showing here is you have this mixed phase updraft and here the um, grapple are, is getting uh, positively charged so that a smaller ice is getting negatively charged. And above that, uh, colder than that minus 15, here we have the grapple getting the negative charge and the small ice getting positive charge. And over time, with the kind of storm motions and trajectories and gravitation, sedimentation, what you get is that kind of tripole structure. So the strongest positive charge on that grapple is the heaviest, it falls out, it's lowest to the ground. Then the grapple with the negative charge combines with that mid-layer negative charge uh, crystals to give you that primary negative charge layer. And then above that, you have the positively charged crystals. And so that's where the idea of that dry pole, tri pole structure comes from. Um, so what happens for lightning to initiate is you get that dipole or tripole structure in a simplified sense. And here again, the negative charge in the mid-layer, upper positive charge and lower positive charge. The lightning initiates uh, between 
two oppositely charged areas where the electric field is a maximum. I won't take you through all the equations, but that's kind of the simple version of it. So it, between like this mid layer negative and a lower positive is where you get the initiation. And then the positive leader travels through negative charge and the negative leader travels through positive charge. And so no matter where it goes in the storm, um, it works like that. So again, break down here between this mid layer negative and upper level positive, you get the negative leader moving through positive charge and the positive leader moving through negative charge. And in this instance, the only difference between an in cloud and a cloud to ground flash is that the cloud to ground flash comes to ground. It initiates in very much the same manner um, in that area of the electric field. So there are cases with towers and stuff that um, do initiate flashes close to the ground, but the majority of cloud to ground flashes are exactly the same way, um, produced in the, very much the same manner of an in cloud. And the only difference between a negative CG and a positive CG in terms of the initiation process is um, the charge areas that they initiate between. So in this case, a negative CG moves through the lower positive charge a positive CG is moving through that lower negative charge. And so normally, and this is what we refer to as our normal um, tripole structure, positive, negative, positive, and this is what we refer to as inverted, which is something we see kind of in more commonly in the Northern Plains um, across you know, Nebraska, Northern Kansas, Northwest Kansas, into um, the Eastern Colorado area. We see this um, kind of inverted polarity structure a little bit more, and that means we see positive CGs a little bit more. And it's all because of how the charging back to the grapple is done within those storms. So basically, the reason the flash rate is so well tied to the storm updraft and intensification process is because essentially your initiation rate, your flash rate will increase when you're developing more charge in your updraft area. And so hopefully that's the kind of tie that binds that all together and why we can use lightning data to really understand storm intensity. So I talked, to, I mentioned that it's really more complex than our simplified model and I think all things typically are. So in a single cell storm, it would look a lot like that. You'd see a dipole or tripole. Um, this is a cross section through a supercell storm. So the black area gives you your reflectivity outline. Here is your updraft core. So this is a cross section again, horizontal distance. Um, this is your updraft area. These contours right here, the darker red and blue are the charge to grapple. So is it gaining positive charge or negative charge? So in the peak updraft area, just like you have a bounded weak echo region, you tend to get not much charge on your, um, on your hydrometeors because they're essentially, just like in, with reflectivity, they're all moving up quickly and not, um, able to stay there because the updraft is so strong. So it's above that um, area where you see that charging. So in this case, positive charging to grapple and on the west side, uh, positive and negative charging to grapple depending on the height and then again, negative charging to grapple. So essentially a lot of different charge in a lot of different areas, especially around the periphery of the updraft. And when you combine that with the trajectories in a supercell storm, basically you get a lot of pockets of charge that go in different directions and some may be horizontally extensive as you get out to like an anvil area, but inside the storm core, it's really um, a bit more uh, complex. Sorry, I just got a note. Can everybody hear me okay? That my internet had gone out. Yeah, you sound fine, Kristen. Okay. Um, all right, moving on to flash size. So another thing we talk about is how different flashes are different sizes and why that might be important. So basically um, in a storm anvil or into a stratiform area, what you get are long horizontally extensive areas for a lightning flash to happen. The lightning initiates between those two areas, but then that flash, that negative leader or that positive leader, positive leader going through negative charge and negative leader going through positive charge, have a really long area to just play and have fun. So those leaders can get really long. So that's why we see really long flashes in like a trailing stratiform of an MCS or a really long flash that if you think about an anvil crawler that maybe you've seen um, across the plains, looking up, you can see those long flashes because it has a long horizontally extensive area of charge to tap into. Now in a storm core, 
it's much more complex than that when you combine the trajectories with the turbulence and all the motion away from a storm updraft essentially you end up with small pockets of positive and negative charge what that means is you can get a lot of flashes because you have a lot of areas in between where that electric field may become maximized but when those flashes initiate those leaders don't have very far to travel so you get a lot of small compact flashes so essentially um, when you have a lightning jump it's driven a lot by these really small flashes so you get like in a supercell it could be a lightning jump from going from like 20 flashes to about 60 flashes and it's going to be all because of these small compact compact flashes so this is an example now again um, this is geary supercell from 2004 and what i'm showing now is outline of a reflectivity is the black again so a little storm to the north main supercell here and then this is a cross section up top um, z or altitude to the left and then this is going across your x y east distance so this is if we were looking at the storm from the south and then if we were looking at the storm from above so this is 10 seconds of lightning data from the storm and all it's color coded by time so essentially the blue flashes happen earlier and the yellow to orange to red is later and what you see is a lot of small flashes sometimes just a few points in and around this area and then as you move from the storm core out to the other to the edges of your kind of main reflexivity they get a little longer and then this is a flash that happened out in the anvil almost you know 80 kilometers away it also produced a cloud to ground flash but it's much longer because it had that horizontally extensive charge that had built up over time so that's what i had about just basic storm electrification i'd love to take questions um it can pertain to the lightning jump or just relationships um there Hopefully I'm not boring you guys. All right, I can move on to you. Um, so a little bit about lightning location systems. I think you guys get a lot of lightning data from a lot of different systems um and i think it's important to understand uh what they show and why and so um essentially when we define a lightning flash it's defined by the technology uh detecting the lightning so if we think first about optical images on satellites so that's like the geostationary lightning mapper um it uses optical or in near infrared spectral lines essentially the channel um, has a breakdown and that gives off um, information for G elements in the 777 nanometers. It provides horizontal extent. So you get that aerial extent, but you're looking down at a storm. So it doesn't give you depth and it can't distinguish between in cloud and cloud to ground lightning. It just needs to have coverage in an optical sense. Um, the other things we have, we have local networks of closely located sensors. So they detect very high frequency radiation. This is like the lightning mapping arrays. We have one in Colorado. We have one in, um, in Oklahoma. There's another in Texas. I know um, St. Louis Cardinals were looking at buying one just for their stadium. I don't think that one worked out though. But essentially these track emissions um, through fast current processes. And these work in three dimensions and have resolutions up to like less almost a meter 10 1 to 10 meters but they're limited to 100 uh, kilometers of the network but they're really great at telling us how the lightning's breaking down in three dimensions next we have national scale networks these are the ones um, most people are familiar with and use so the nldn the earth networks um, they measure kind of a cross band from very low frequency radiation to low frequency to medium frequency so um, basically somewhere around 100 meters to one kilometer in terms of accuracy generally in the smaller side of that um, they measure both cloud pulses and cg return strokes essentially um the nldn is better at doing the cg return strokes because it focuses more on the vlf to lf earth networks is a little bit better at picking up the kind of cloud pulses than the NLDN has historically been because it has a wider band so it's getting into that medium frequency closer towards that VHF which is what you get from in-cloud flashes 
Um, then there are the global scale networks. So um, GLD360 is in this and Wolin is another type. Um, essentially, they depend on the Earth ionosphere interaction. So when a cloud to ground flash happens specifically, it gives off a lot of very long, low frequency radiation. And essentially that's lower bandwidth and it can bounce off the ionosphere and then even do a couple of bounces and you can still triangulate it with a, at least three sensors. Um, but with that, because you're depending on that ionosphere, you can have a lot of distance between your sensors. So this is just a nice little graph to kind of give that idea. So like the lightning mapping arrays are very focused in the VHF and that can give you in cloud propagation. So the leaders as they propagate, you know where they are and where they've been. Um, most uh, NLDN and earth networks are in this kind of low frequency to broadband area. Um, cloud to ground are gonna be really responsive in the VLF, LF. And then um, similarly, the global scale networks are in that VLF. So what does this look like when we think about what we see for lightning versus what the different systems are seeing? So the National Lightning Detection Network gives us that location historically going back to 1988 um, for more than 30 years, uh, the location of the cloud to ground network or cloud to ground location. Earth networks with their broadband sensor and now NLDN with what they've been adding to their sensors to help detect, uh, give us a little bit more about the in-cloud. It's not the entire propagation system, but if we think about what you see for Earth networks pulses, you're getting kind of a point here, a point there, um, a different kind of energetic breakdowns, whether it's a K change or an M component. Um, there's some discussion there still, but you're getting a few more kind of things for a single flash. What the LMA or something in the VHF gives us is that entire propagation process. So we can use that to see how the channels propagate. If you think back to a few images ago, I had that supercell. We can see that lightning flash in the anvil where it began and where it propagated out to across like 50 kilometers in distance. And so that gives us a lot of detailed information that we can learn a lot about storms. So in terms of detection efficiency and what they do show, so this is a comparison of the various long range systems. Um, sorry, I had some color problems here, but oops. The Earth Networks gives us where essentially, in this case, let me back up and just say, if we pin all the detections from Earth Networks, from the Vaisalas World Merge, so that's NLDN and GLD360, and Woolen, and put them all in a pile and basically decided, found out what percentage of the networks did anything unique beyond the first network. This is color coded in that way. This was work done by Phil Blitzer of the University of Alabama, Huntsville, and um, his group down there. So essentially, the hotter the red, the more Earth networks is detecting in that area. The hotter the green, the brighter the green, the more that's NLDN or GLA 360. Um, and the brighter the blue is more of woolen doing kind of detections there. So um, you can see some spatial disparity uh, across the globe. Um, I will say based on their detection points, woolen can space out their um, sensors really far. Because again, this is in the far VLF, they're depending on ionospheric interactions. And so they get similar coverage across the world. And then what happens with um, NLDN is it combined with the GLD360. So again, larger coverage of um, sensors, they've added more than Woolen has, so additional GLD360. And then um, equal area coverage kind of in the United States where we historically know of the NLDN. And then Earth Networks, again, you see some different areas that glow really red, and that's because with their broadband, they're really depending on um, having multiple sensors of coverage in the same area. And that's what allows them to pick up on the additional in-cloud lightning pulses. So in areas like the Eastern United States, um, where Weatherbug was first developed and these sensors were first attached, they have lots of sensors in like um, populated areas because they were attached to populated, um, to people who bought sensors. Um, and that's less so in the Western United States. So there is kind of a disparity as you go across the areas. So in the, like the Northern Plains, um, NLDN and GLD360 may be more dependable 
than Earth networks just because they don't have the sensors um, equally spaced in that area. So hopefully that gives some kind of um, context to why you see different numbers and different flash amounts or different pulses or strokes from these different networks. Um, but again, I'm happy to answer any questions that you want to pop in the chat. So I talked a little bit about that lightning mapping array. This is what how that works. It's a VHF. Um, usually we're working around channel three or something in that 60 to 66 megahertz area. So, you know, similar to the older TV bands there. Essentially, it is a line of sight system. So we do need to be kind of compact. So you get, you need at least four stations to measure time of arrival. So that's X, Y, Z, and T. Um, better you do, the more stations you have. So generally we need at least um, six to call it an operational system. Um, ideally, we have something like 11. But what it gives you is this total information about a lightning flash. So this is an example of a cloud to ground flash that initiates up at eight kilometers, goes immediately to ground, has a cloud to ground point, and then this is the time and then travels out. And then you can see it in height versus east-west distance. Over here is height um, on the scale versus north-south distance. So this is if you're looking at the storm from the west, and this is if you're looking at the storm from the south. And the, this main panel down here is your top-down view. and gives you kind of that idea of what you expect lightning to look like, not just a single point where it came to ground, but it initiated and later propagated out, um, outwards away as it continued to propagate. Then you got this recoil streamer that came all the way back down and then went back down to ground for, as another return stroke. And you can see all of that information in detail with the lightning wrapping array. And it's really cool stuff um, to look at. And in terms of density, if we think about it from that lightning mapping array, this takes us back to a supercell storm that produced a number of tornadoes um, God, 16 years now, uh, 16 years ago now. So this was a high risk day. Storms went up along the dry line in Oklahoma. Um, and now this density is this heat color map. So you see the storms exist, uh, go across. This lasted for like eight hours. This loop is like six hours long. Um, lightning extending way out into the anvil, um, going across much of the state of Oklahoma. You can see things like this um, lightning hole associated with that bounded weak echo region as that storm went through the cyclic processes. So it's really neat, cool stuff. Um, not everybody has one to use though, sadly. Um, if we think about lightning density in terms of LDN, this is taking us back to that, again, VLF radiation. It looks something like this as a lightning propagates the points. Now, what we can make use of is the geostationary lightning mapper now um, operationally. So the GLM is basically a camera in space. Um, it has different CCDs, essentially onboard processing camera kind of units that combine to give you that full picture. So um, this is what it looks like in its raw sense, um, center there, uh, the equator, given kind of the northern and southern Americas in coverage for that. So a little bit about the CCD imaging area. I don't want to get too much into the details, but hopefully I'll give you a, a little idea of how um, things look. So um, field view of coverage, you get east and then GLM west. Uh, area of overlap here in the central plains, northern central plains is a question mark about which will give you the best look. Um, looking at for looking at the details of forecasters and the hazardous weather test bed, particularly at storms there in South Dakota and North Dakota, it changes day to day and it depends on the angle of the storm. So if you have a lot of storm depth um, kind of to the south and east, um, GLM East might not be the best thing to look at. It might be the GLM West sensor will give you better uh, detection efficiency. I'll get into that a little bit more in just a second. But basically how it works, like I said, it was in the 777 nanometer um, area. They have a solar blocking filter and basically they're looking in this narrow band to see um, the oxygen lines produced by lightning as it uh, propagates and gives that off. So it works during day or night, but it is a little bit better overnight. And um, you can sometimes see that detection efficiency go up um, after sundown. On the basic sense, uh, GLM 
defect, detects an event. So that's a single optical detection in its little gridded window that is every two milliseconds. Now, what does an event mean in terms of the lightning image? Not much. So what they do is they group those events into groups. And so that's essentially one or more events on a single adjacent pixels occurring in, during a particular time integration. And then flashes, everything needs a definition um, to get at that basic idea of a flash. But again, that definition is a little bit different depending on the sensor you're looking at. So for GLM, that's 330 milliseconds or 16 and a half kilometers. Um, GLM, if you look at the raw level two data, essentially it's just points. Um, that's not what the sensor is detecting, but that's how it's transmitted in files and data packets. So it's just given as these little X's. But what we do is we then recombine them to give you these GLM grids um, that everybody should have access to. What that involves is a lot of parent-child hierarchy and reconstituting what the original data was. So um, the GLM grids may seem like they're a secondary kind of product, but really what we do is we reproduce what the sensor was producing before everything was broken down into individual file packets. Um, hopefully that helps explain it. So I talked a little bit about that field of view and the detection efficiency. I will say this work from Ken Cummins came across like two weeks of data. It's not an end all be all. So it's whatever storms were going on during those two weeks um, when he compared. So the detection efficiency of both, because we're getting out towards the edge of the field of view in the Northern Plains is a little bit scattered. And so that area of overlap is actually one of the regions that can be the most effective to look at the different GLM East versus GLM West to get the full idea of what's going on. All right, so I've mentioned the GLM grids a little bit. And one of the reasons we produce the grids is to get out of this GLM location errors in the raw level two data. Essentially, in that processing, they add something called a lightning ellipsoid. Essentially, um, that lightning ellipsoid is this black line here. And it assumes clouds are tallest at the equator. And then as you go towards the North Pole, um, clouds are shorter. Uh, we know that's not exactly true. It may be true in a broad, broad sense, but stronger storms are going to produce lightning flashes up higher weaker storms are gonna have lower flashes. And what that causes is essentially a third, fourth, or fifth parallax errors. Um, because they make this general fixed coordinate um, assumption, uh, what you get in the raw GLM data is one error parallax that you see with ABI. Then you see a different parallax with the GLM, and it will be different ways for different storms. And the ellipsoid, seem to magnify that. So what we do is we take out that ellipsoid assumption and then put it back on the ABI fixed grid. So when you look at the GLM grids, it should be essentially in the same location as the advanced baseline imager parallax. Um, and then what I generally recommend people do is compare it to the ground-based lightning systems to give you that clear understanding of what the parallax is. So that kind of takes me to the idea of what do you see with the GLM versus the other networks. So this is an example. This is a four panel from the hazardous weather test bed. Um, now, two years ago, this was in eastern United States in the New Jersey kind of New York shore area. Um, top left is flash extent density in that GLM grid. Uh, to the right is flash size. This at that point was average flash size. We've now gone to a minimum flash size. Um, optical energy here and then compared it to earth networks. So what you're getting with the um, flash density is that clearest idea of where the strongest storms were. So this is essentially, um, I don't have the radar data I think for this one, but you're getting storms, they were new storms were developing to the south and west and these were the strongest storms. These were weaker but still producing lightning that was going out into the stratiform area. You see that pretty well in the flash size um, smallest compact flashes where you have the strongest updrafts were in those new areas. A um, lot bigger flashes here um, with the cells that are a little bit older. And then you had this trailing stratiform flash that was much, much bigger in that area. So 
Um, generally, what I recommend um, as forecasters of coming to the hazardous weather testbed is definitely to combine the GLM data with the cloud to ground earth networks or um, in cloud lightning data and then cloud to ground from the NLDN. So it's three different systems, but it gives you a holistic view of the lightning activity. You get the spatial extent from GLM and then the I in cloud and I, it's a C CG ratio in locations from the ground based networks. So essentially what that does, and I talked a little bit about how that will show that parallax. So the GLM parallax, this is again a flash extent density up on the top left. You see the in cloud kind of flashes just offset to the south and east in this case. And that will be, if this were um, looking at GL, from GLM west, it would be to the north and east. Um, so in this case, we do have the flash extent density over here is the event density. So that raw, sun, uh, the initial raw detections. Um, some forecasters have enjoyed looking at that because it shows maybe sometimes a little bit more definition and a little bit more extent. Um, this is that minimum flash area now. So the yellowest would be the strongest storms uh, or, or the newest storms and then flash energy, which is essentially just the brightness back to the sensor. Um, in the hazardous weather testbed, forecasters have seen increased confidence in warning decisions when GLM products have matched that from other observational platforms. Um, essentially, the GLM products were used to efficiently match the data to other satellite products and to other lightning and radar trends. So increased confidence, earlier um, warning decisions. So this is an example of forecaster use uh, GLM flash extent density. So here we have the northern line has produced sporadic wind damage and uh, they were noticing a tight gradient in the reflectivity, possibly a rear inflow notch. Um, but they were entering at the same time a more stable air mass. And looking at the GLM, they were really see just seeing essentially all the um, lightning data kind of going away and decided to cut off the warning on the northern end of the storms. A um, couple of cases from Wyoming here. Uh, so this is June 6th of developing convection along the front range and just seeing that uh, peak up in both the intensity um, and just in really poor radar coverage, being able to see it in the GLM. So again, uh, forecasters like using the GLM products kind of for pulse convective environments. So they're helpful for anticipating storm growth and or dissipation and looking at uh, decision support services applications. Um, so generally forecasters frequently found the GLM most useful in situations where intense thunderstorms were not the consideration. So if you're making warning decisions and you know you have a lot of hail and things going on, there's probably you don't need the GLM to kind of help with. The GLM seems to be in the more marginal cases of watching different things evolve. So this is an example up um, near the Chicago area, looking at um, going over into the lake as well. Um, comment from a forecaster in our blog was from a, a decision support services standpoint, the minimum flash area and the flash extent density proved that it's necessary to look at both GLM products and ground-based lightning products to see the total picture. Here, GLM um, product captures the larger flash that extended out into the stratiform area behind the main line that is not seen in the Earth Networks and NLDN products. This information can be especially important for airport weather warnings and outdoor event and venues. So in this case, you know, you have your main line, which seems, you know, the obvious area of consideration, but there was also lightning going out and over into the lake, and the GLM was picking up on those large flashes that were um, continuing out into that area. Um, it's about storm growth. I'm gonna skip that and then we'll go into some of the probabilistic stuff. But I'm happy to take questions about any of the lightning location systems um, or anything with that at this point. Hopefully I'm so not just speaking out into the ether. <laughs> we do have some questions, but they're from earlier in your presentation. Do you about stuff earlier in the presentation? You want to hold those to the end? Um, no, I can go ahead. Now's a good breaking point. So okay, okay. Uh, one question was uh, they said not boring at all. Uh, to your <laughs> comment, uh, totally, 
totally interesting how complex it is compared to previous simplified explanations. I'd like to know how you end up with a cloud to ground strike i.e., why don't you why don't strikes just stay contained in the cloud if that's where all the charge differential is? How do I explain this to my elementary school kids? Oh, wow, that's a really good question. So essentially, um, let me see if I want to back up. I'm gonna go to this slide. So um looking at that left area, what um how these end up going to ground is essentially there is a lot more charge in this mid layer negative than there is in the lowest positive. So this leader, this positive leader wants to keep breaking down and it's in this area of electric energy that it's just like, oh, I got electrons, there's positive charge, I'm so happy to continue breaking down. But there needs to be an additional equal breakdown on the other side, essentially. But this area, let's say this negative leader, it's looking for positive charge and it can't, it can't find it. Well, the atmosphere is still a conductor. Like I said, there is a fair weather electric field. It's not like, you know, connecting to metal would be, but it still is breaking down. So you have, this leader is still like very happy looking saying, I got an electron, you got an electron, I'm moving it through my channel. Um, but this one's wanting to, and essentially it's the, electric forces of propagation on this one that forces this to continue looking and you know here at the ground there is a lot of stuff that builds up charge so a tower for instance has charge building up upon it just in response to this lowest layer of charge so if you have positive charge here at the lowest layer essentially what you have is negative charge coming together at the ground because it is attracted to the storm up above so essentially, um, atmosphere is not a perfect conductor, but it can work as one. Um, and if there's lots of charge up here, this leader wants to continue and it will, because it will see that charge. It might be a jump to get there, but that's why you see that step leader process, not to get into the real crazy lightning physics of it, but essentially it tries, it doesn't make it, it tries again, it doesn't make it, it keeps trying until it makes it as long as this propagation is still going on in the cloud. Hopefully that answers that question. Maybe more complex way than I needed to. Great, thanks, Kristen. You're welcome. Any other ones? Um, yeah, I actually had one. I was really curious about um, back in the similar part of the presentation. You talked about the inverted structure of the tripole and how it was favored in some reasons. Like I believe you mentioned Colorado and the Northern Plain. I'm curious about the geographical. Um, relationship there? Why are those areas favored? So yeah, many years ago, um, no, 20 years ago, there was a storm project called Steps. Um, it's, uh, I don't even remember what they all stand for, but Steps, the whole idea was to look at why do positive CGs occur more in this area? Um, and there's some great papers going, that came out of steps from Tim Lang and Dr. Larry Carey um, that look at this. But essentially, for the same reason we get a lot of low precipitation supercells in that area, it's the same reason essentially that storms become uh, uh, inverted and produce a lot of positive CGs. So, uh, you know, it's essentially has to do with how um, moisture is driven in that area compared to areas in like the Southeast United States where you have a lot more moisture. Um, and convergence and storms are driven a little bit differently. That's the short answer. But um, yeah, you see that there are various differences in terms of cape, in terms of, yeah, moisture, um, LCL heights, all that's kind of tied to it all. Okay, all right, great. Um, we have another one uh, from St. Louis. What operationally relevant information does optical energy or minimum flash area provide that we don't already see in flash extent density? Yes, great question. So um, what we see with the minimum flash area is that tie to the flash size. So in this sense that an intensifying storm is gonna produce a lot of small flashes. And that's why we've actually moved from um, average flash area to minimum flash area is because we really wanted to capture that smaller flashes in new and intensifying storms. Um, a storm going through a cyclic process, you'll be able to see 
kind of the smaller flash size driving as that kind of re-intensifies. So that's a little bit about flash size. And then similarly, you'll get those really long, horizontally extensive stuff uh, flashes going through like animals and MCSs. And as long as you know that a flash like that can happen in an area, you know that you have a chance of a cloud to ground flash occurring. Um, and it's often those type of flashes that maybe you don't have a lot of precipitation ongoing, but it's those flashes that often kill people because they think, oh, it's safe to go outside now. Uh, it's not raining. Um, so in terms of flash size, hopefully it gives some kind of context for that. Flash energy is a really interesting question. I wish I had a good answer for you. Um, it's one of the reasons this hasn't become an operational product yet is we don't have necessarily the meteorological ties. One thing I can say that we've seen um, in like supercell analysis uh, is that similar to like a three body scatter spike, not being a real artifact, but telling you something important is going on large hail. Um, the energy seems to have a similar tie. When we get really strong storms that are producing large ice um, that have a really big optical depth, that energy takes a dive. I think there are gonna be some really interesting applications that can use that. Um, it is an artifact of the system, essentially, because you're looking at the accumulated brightness back. Um, so if you have a really strong storm with a lot of optical depth, it distinguishes uh, that kind of light out of the top of the storm cloud. So you see um, this dip in the energy at the same time, you see something like mesh increase. Um, Meanwhile, those stratiform flashes in terms of energy are really bright because they don't have a lot of optical um, kind of or blocking, anything blocking that optical sensor. And I'm sorry, I'm talking with my hands, which you guys obviously can't see, but I just realized that and it was kind of funny to me. Um, anyway, the energy, you can see the channels break down through like that main channel area of those big flashes in an MCS. I don't think I have any examples in this presentation. But I think, you know, one of the interesting things is in terms of historical um, data that we've had access to. So we've had radar data for many, many years and have learned a lot over the years. GLM is a brand new instrument and I think we're still learning stuff with every uh, severe weather season, every um, different storm that we begin to analyze. And we're just now kind of linking it all together. Um, with the other data sets we have and the publications are just now coming out. So it's a fun instrument in terms of like the operational community and the research community gets their hands on at a very similar time. So energy is something we're still learning a lot about and if it's useful or not. I know the main engineer from Lockheed Martin that created the instrument loves energy. He thinks it's the primary, like what the system detects, um, but he's also not seeing it with the meteorological artifacts that uh, happen. So. Hopefully that answered that question. Great, thanks, Kristen. We have uh, Matt Bunkers in Rapid City with his hand raised. Matt, you're unmuted. Yeah, Kristen, regarding the uh, tripole structure, um, one image that you had, at the bottom of the storm, there was a positive layer. So I assume that would induce negative charge of the ground. So then how would you get a negative CG going from the middle negative portion of the storm to what I assume would be negatively charged ground? Right. So that's a great question. Um, and that uh, kind of attaches to the step leader process. So um, essentially, yes, you're right. And that's why um, essentially what you're referring to is the corona charge that occurs in t um, as a storm is overhead. So, you know, people who often are out in the mountains would see their hair stand up if due to the response of the electric field above them. And so that's the uh, same kind of idea. So um, essentially, yes, you're right. That's negative charge. And it connects with that in the same way that I was talking about earlier, that the positive leader is still kind of growing. And sometimes you'll see that. You essentially see that as through the recoil process. So um, going back to like a conceptual model of a cloud to ground flash, it steps out once and then it steps out again and it keeps propagating. But you know, if you're watching a high speed video, it's going, 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 but it doesn't actually connect the ground in that way. What happens is the response from the storm at the ground then drives 
back up and you get that recoil streamer and that return current. And that's what produces that big flash as it connects back to the negative charge, essentially all the way back in the mid layer of the storm. I had, ooh, I did have, instead of going through all my things in that LMA example, this is an example of um, that return stroke, that red that can, comes back so this would have been into another charge layer and essentially it comes back and then goes all the way back to ground. I don't know if that explained it at all. Now, lightning starting from a tower is totally different than this process. Like if you had a tall tower underneath a storm, um, essentially you can have something like a lightning flash go across, it changes the um, charge that's in the bottom of the cloud. So it dissipates the charge and can even flip the charge. And so that can actually start a lightning flash from something like a tower that goes up into the storm, which is a different process. I don't know, I can't Thanks. see faces, so yeah. Um, we have one more uh, from Linda Gilbert Marquette. She said, based on the uh, answer to the question that I asked earlier about, um, the, the frequency of positive strikes at the, the inverted uh, tripole, she said, then is it expected that positive charges are more likely to be observed in LP cells and or as drier air is entering into an updraft, or am I misunderstanding that process? No, that's very much right. She's exactly Great, right. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, no other questions at this time that I can see. Okay. So, um, I think I'll conclude with the storm-based lightning prediction because we're already kind of closer to an hour. So um, one of the things we're developing, uh, it's all part of this facets, which I'm, has been kind of out there for a while, paradigm, um, and our probabilistic hazard information. So in the uh, Heather's, Heather's weather test bay, we've been testing this idea as a um, fee, as a delivery mechanism for emerging tools such as worn on forecast. Um, for the probabilistic hazard information we've tested, forecasters essentially issue hazard-based probability plumes. Um, not going to worry about the warning polygons. There's a whole communication and other people studying that. But essentially, it provides time of arrival and threat level based on probability. This remains um, with the storm and in motion with the storm as long as the forecaster determines it's valid. So one of the things we wanted to do for lightning is a lot of forecasters aren't um, used to generally predicting lightning as part of their day-to-day -day job. There's no requirement for it, even though lightning does obviously produce risk to life and property. So we went through a machine learning process to develop these probabilities. We did a training data set. It was really important to us to get a variety of cases. So we did more than a year, um, multiple days from the month, and then did validation, which were on totally separate days. Um, we grabbed these days at random so we wouldn't be um, synoptically tied, all those important things. And so uh, anytime you go through a machine learning process, I think it's really important, the data collection and the cleaning the data and building the algorithm um, so you don't over tune it. So one of the things we did is we um, got more than one and a half million total storm samples across that. We used kind of a K-means watershed technique to track storms of reflectivity at minus 10. Um, and that way you can get attributes associated with each storm. And then we uh, blended a variety of data sources. So lightning data from multiple networks. This was before the GLM. We're going to need to redo it to add GLM. Um, but MRMS data and then near storm environment data. So after we gathered all that data, we combine it. Uh, we chose to use a random forest. Um, random forest essentially is an ensemble of trees. So an ensemble of decision trees. One decision tree um, is really kind of a poor predictor. So let's just say, hey, is it raining? Yes. Is there lightning? Yes or no, kind of going down that. Um, we use 300 trees with about six decisions. Um, one of the reasons we like random forests is they're really fast. And another thing when you're dealing with operational data is it can also deal with unbalanced or missing data. So if we're missing the near storm environment information, that's not a big deal. If the lightning data cuts out, it's not a big deal. So um, with random forts, we know what's going on as opposed to some of the deep um, learning or neural nets. Whereas when you're missing some data, you don't know exactly how it affects things. 
And so um, from my point of view, I like knowing what's going on. Um, with Random Forest, um, you can get a data ranking. So how high it is in the tree, um, that's the red bar. So across our 300 trees and making those kind of decisions, um, knowing that storm has a history of producing cloud to ground lightning, that's 15 minutes of cloud to ground lightning is really important. Although that varies a lot from tree to tree, it can be really high or not at all in that tree. Similarly, um, it looks like all in cloud and other lightning data is the most important. Then um, again, as a meteorologist that knows what's kind of how it's all connected, seeing um, vertically integrated terms and reflectivity in the mixed phase as being important. Um, that's good to see. And then at the lowest levels, um, the least importance in our trees are things like, um, you know, the surface temperature and mid-level shear. So getting into some of those environmental things. Um, we initially did this all in one big grouping for the United States, and it did pretty well, um, but it was, it seemed to be weighted towards southern uh, and central region. And so one of the things we did is we separated out eastern region and western region um, based on climatological differences. So for all the storms we tracked, so this is kind of that climatology um, base rate where the no skill um, passes that. So in terms of high key skill scores is where all that impacts is. But essentially what it tells us is about 35% of the storms we tracked had a um, probability of producing lightning in some southern and central region and eastern and western that gets a little bit lower. So it's just how the scale kind of works. For reliability, we're pretty happy we sit right on that uh, reliability line all the way from the lower probabilities to the highest probabilities. So um, pretty good. And then breaking it out, southern region, central region, eastern and western, um, this way we are able to tune the algorithm to those particular areas and those number of storm samples. So from there, we can now take it to the step of putting it into that probabilistic hazard information in V um, to produce those lightning plumes working with forecasters. So um, our V tool in our web-based V tool kind of set up for hazard services looks something like this. Um, the forecaster can then pick the lightning frequency. This is a small cell that had just initiated and hadn't produced any lightning yet. Um, if it was, that would automatically be picked for the forecaster. Um, but in this case, I think the forecaster went with occasional lightning um, in developing. And then this is what the algorithm set. So we have it set in like 15 minute chunks and then it interpolates between those 15 minutes going out to the hour. Um, and then the forecaster can add a discussion. So, and that can either be done all automatically or integrating the forecaster through those steps. I will say when we work with end users, they much prefer the forecaster being um, integrated to the full um, process as opposed to um, just having the automated plumes going out. But essentially, this is all still very much in development and testing. But what that looks like is we can have plumes for different hazards. So in this case, we have the tornado um, severe and then the lightnings in the background, giving you kind of different ideas of which storms have the most highest likelihood and which directions they're going and then you can overway time of arrival. And, you know, these are the kind of things that can be sent out to the public and, um, you know, used to communicate with end users. So I think I'll end here for today. I have a little bit about wildfires, but, um, if anybody's interested in theirs, I can go through those quickly, but otherwise I think this is a good stopping point.